Welcome to the St. Louis University Craft Talks, part of the St. Louis Literary Awards series of programming with our host, Ted Iber, and special guest, Rachel Greenwald-Smith. The St. Louis Literary Award was created by the Library Associates of St. Louis University in 1967. To learn more about the Literary Award and the writers that we have honored over the years, check out the book, The St. Louis Literary Award by St. Louis University Archivist Emeritus, John Wade. We would also like to thank our sponsors for the Craft Talk series, Left Bank Books and Caldi's Coffee Roasting Company. Left Bank Books is one of the oldest and largest independently owned bookstores in the nation, offering a full line of new and used books, gifts, cards, magazines, toys, and services. You can order Rachel Greenwald Smith books at a 20% discount if you let them know that you saw this interview. Caldi's Coffee Roasting Company is dedicated to creating a memorable coffee experience for their customers and guests, committing to sustainable business practices, providing educational opportunities, and supporting the communities in which they serve. And now, without further ado, Rachel Greenwald Smith. Rachel Greenwald Smith is the author of On Compromise, Art, Politics, and the Fate of an American Ideal, and Affect and American Literature in the Age of Neoliberalism. She's an associate professor of English at St. Louis University, where she teaches courses at the graduate and undergraduate level on contemporary literature and critical theory. Dr. Greenwald Smith's essays have appeared in the Virginia Quarterly Review, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and the Yale Review. Her academic articles have appeared in Novel, a form on fiction, Post 45 Peer Reviewed, American Literature, Mediations, Modern Fiction Studies, and elsewhere. She's edited two volumes of scholarship, Neoliberalism and Contemporary Literary Culture with Mitchum Hulls, and American Literature in Transition from 2000 to 2010. Dr. Greenwald Smith is the recipient of an American Council of Learned Society's Rice Camp Fellowship. She's originally from Portland, Oregon, but now resides in St. Louis, Missouri. All right, Rachel Greenwald Smith, I am so, so happy to have you here to kick off season two of Craft Talks at St. Louis University. We, uh, I think I first approached you about this about exactly a year ago um, before, um, as you were, I, I don't know if you had finished your book or if it was still in the editing process, but a huge congratulations to um, On Compromise coming out recently, as you can see my marked up copy. Um, really exciting to be at this place after a full year. So glad you're here. So glad to be here. Um, I thought that we could start with uh, the way I've been starting all of these with, uh, with writers um, on writing process. So let's get right to it. I've got my notes in hand. And to those of who are just listening to it, they won't see it. So I look way more professional. Um, all right. So your essays in On Compromise utilize a wide range of topics as framing devices for your thoughts on art, music, politics, and the fate of the American ideal, including racial segregation in St. Louis, which is where we are right now, Obamacare, and the COVID-19 lockdown. So my first question is, how do ideas come to you? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is that since this book is a bit of a departure for me in terms of the writing style, um, ideas came to me differently for this project than I have in the past. So my previous work was largely scholarly and kind of oriented toward an academic audience. And in that context, arguments largely came to me the way that they come to, I think, a lot of scholars, which is to sort of notice a discussion that's happening in the field and think about how, um, I would sort of think about how I could contribute to that conversation. Um, in this book, through a number of twists and turns, I ended up deciding to write it as a book sort of oriented toward a popular audience. And once that happened, um, ideas started coming to me, I would say more intuitively than they did during the scholarly writing process for me in the mm -hmm. past. So, um, one of the things that writing for a public audience sort of freed up for me was that I could say, like, be walking down Del Mar Avenue and thinking about segregation, and then it would I could sort of imagine how that could get folded into the book, or I could be sitting at home during COVID lockdown thinking about how we were in a remarkably uncompromising situation and how that might fit into a book on compromise. Right. Um, as a scholar, I often found myself having to kind of push those kinds of thoughts away because they seemed like they could um, disrupt kind of the 
specificity of the argument that I was often trying to make about literary culture. So it was a real pleasure to let that those kinds of things in. Um, you know, there's a lot of personal anecdote in the book. So um, I would have a conversation with a friend or with my spouse or with my child, and those kinds of things seemed like their game. And so they would, again, sort of drift in in ways that were sometimes surprising to me, but um, ultimately, I think, um, much more pleasurable and a certain, in a certain sense more intellectually honest than my process has been in the past. So. Were, were there were there uh, were there topics that you 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 took on and you started writing about and then eventually jettisoned, like th that didn't make oh, it to yeah. the book? Yeah. Yes, lots and lots of topics, especially because the book did sort of go through a number of iterations as it moved from being possibly a scholarly book to being a public facing book. Um, so I had an original draft that I was sending to both trade publishers and academic publishers. And that draft had a lot more on sort of the nitty gritty of literary culture in it. And a lot of that material mm. got jettisoned. And a lot of readings of novels um, got jettisoned in that process too. There's still a lot of work on fiction in the book, um, but a lot of the, some of the chapters that I thought I might write that were about say a single book, um, got tossed just partly because I didn't think that as many readers would be interested in reading 20 pages of my thoughts on like George Saunders. Um, so, I mean, maybe you would. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say you could save it for the B-side release. Yeah, yeah. It's not going to be the last music analogy I make. Uh, that's good. Um, no, there, there, there's definitely a whole set of B-sides from this book. And some of it got published actually as academic article in the form of an of academic yeah. articles as I was going along. So I was pushing stuff off and publishing it in scholarly venues because it felt more appropriate for a scholarly audience. As I yeah, was. okay, okay. Well, this this next question kind of, uh, your, your answer kind of bleeds into this one, but uh, how did you decide on creating the structure of On Compromise? in that you frequently weave in personal stories from your past and present with more global topics, politics, uh, Black Lives Matter, liberalism and illiberalism, pop culture, and so on. Was there a point in, um, in putting these pieces together where you made a decision to interweave your personal stories? Uh, for me, it is, it is the glue of the book. And I mean that as a huge compliment. I love that aspect of it. That's wonderful to hear. It was the part of the book that I was the most nervous about, so I'm, I'm mm. glad it worked for you. Um, the process of coming to a structure, yeah, I mean, it was a really slow process for me because I'm not trained in creative nonfiction. So I don't know a lot of the craft of nonfiction writing as a sort of set of procedures. And I think I probably could have saved a lot of time if I did, because I think I, I ended up having to kind of reinvent the wheel myself. Like I mm. only learned what a braided essay was after I had written one and was like, oh, that's what I did. <laughs> if, someone, if someone had told me, it would have helped me a lot. Um, yeah. So it's the, the book sort of started, um, as I said, with a lot of reflections on literature. And then as I started allowing other material in, it sort of turned into a set of very sort of short vignettes about a range of observations. And so the initial draft of the book actually had um, a lot of chapters where I would introduce sort of an example and then leave it and then introduce another example and then leave it. And it was working in part with the editors at Grey Wolf that helped me see that a more sustained engagement with some of those examples would really help readers find grounding in what I was saying. Um, because Absolutely. I think I was, I was so overwhelmed initially by just all of the places I was seeing compromise. You know, that was kind of what gave the inspiration for thinking outside of literature in the first place was just seeing compromise everywhere that I just sort of felt like throwing it all at the page. And so I was encouraged to slow down and develop some of those examples. And I'm really glad I did because I learned a lot in the process as well. I, I gotta tell you, I find that fascinating and I, I will address this later, but, but I do teach creative nonfiction and I will be using examples from this essay on, on how, to, how to write good creative nonfiction. So the fact that you didn't feel like you have much of a background in it, I feel like, like the essays particularly, again, were the ones where you're drawing in your personal experiences, to me, a total masterclass on how to do it. So fantastic. Ooh. I'm glad wow. you made the decision. Well, all of my gratitude goes to the editors at my press that I worked with, because they really did. I mean, I think they had to do some heavy lifting with me because of my lack of knowledge, and they taught me a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah, so great that that, that you, you learned that in the, in the process. I love that. You, you describe in the book uh, compromise as several things, noting that it can be viewed as both a means and an end, um, that compromise is a container for conflict and that it can be an ugly thing. 
how how did you first become interested in the, in the whole idea of compromise? Well, um, I first became interested in it in literary culture. So I, and this is when I thought that it was going to be a book of scholarship. It was because I um, had just finished a book on neoliberalism and literature where I was really interested in how changes in contemporary economic policy might be affecting um, literary production. And not just in terms of the institutions that have changed, like the way that publishing has changed, for instance, because mm -hmm. of neoliberalization, but also because of the way in which um, uh, subjects living under, all of us living under contemporary conditions of capitalism learn to see ourselves differently because we're encouraged to market ourselves, because we're encouraged to think of our lives on sort of an investment return basis and all of these things. And so I was thinking about how that, Absolutely. how that fed into literature. So um, what I started noticing um, about compromising literature was essentially that part of the way that literary fiction was being marketed was as um, offering readers a chance to both sort of feel smart <laughs> by reading novels that had a certain amount of difficulty or certain kinds of experimental features, but also giving readers kind of an easy time of it by making mm -hmm. these um, sort of what might have previously been kind of avant-garde gestures accessible. And I was, interested in that, I was interested in that as a sales tactic. And I was also interested in how it changed writers' experiences of coming to their writing, of, of, of being um, taught in MFA programs and yeah. encouraged by presses to write this kind of work. And so I thought I was going to write a book that was exclusively about what I still call in this book compromise aesthetics, which was a term that I coined to describe the kind of literature that does this, that makes compromise compromises between experimentalism and accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, so I saw it there first. And then once I started sort of looking into the political conditions that I saw giving rise to this situation, literary culture, I started realizing that there's a lot going on in politics that was really interesting for its own sake <laughs> and a lot going on outside of yeah. the political domain, but in other forms of cultural production that seemed interested, interesting in, for its own sake, you know, in music, in film, in television, and so on and so forth. And that's when the, the project really started expanding. It, it probably seemed like areas of compromise were popping up in every, every venue of your life because it was yeah. so present in, in just what you were thinking about. Since you were thinking about doing a project with it, I'm sure it was just, it must have seemed everywhere and probably still does. <laughs> It's true. I was recently in a meeting with colleagues where one of I was trying to make a compromise about a policy I was trying to introduce, and the colleague sort of called me out and was like, "Ooh, look, Rachel's <laughs> making a compromise." Oh my gosh, <laughs> like, oh, that's gonna no. that's gonna follow you your entire <laughs> life, no doubt about it. Uh, but I think I think for the better. <laughs> yeah. So your work grapples with with some really heady politically polarizing topics, or some politically polarizing topics, such as the concept of neoliberalism, modernism versus postmodernism. Uh, and beyond. So could you give our listeners uh, and viewers an overview of liberalism and illiberalism for those who may not be all that well versed in the terms? Sure. Yeah, that's quite a task. I could probably teach a whole class on it, but I'll do my best. Oh, you could probably do the entire time. podcast on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so cut me off if I start blathering okay. on. Um, so uh, liberalism, as I deal with it in the book, is a political, uh, ten political sort of ideology or political tendency that privileges the individual, that privileges freedom, um, and that often also brings with it a focus on rational debate, um, moderation, uh, careful policy development, and sort of rules governing democratic culture. Um, so liberalism is important to me because the United States was founded as essentially a liberal sure. country. Um, you know, uh, uh, we, we believe ideally in values of individual freedom above all else, um, or at least that's the idea of the American project. Mm -hmm. um, and compromise is, in my opinion, a liberal value because if you um, develop a nation state that's based on individual freedom, the way that you imagine rulemaking to proceed is by compromises among different individuals who may have competing values. Um, and then that, you know, sort of over the course of the, um, over the course of time, one of the arguments I'm making in the book or sort of an underlying argument of the book is that those compromises that inevitably happen in liberal democracy start stop being just sort of 
practical or sort of conditional realities and take on this kind of moral value for themselves. Mm -hmm. So rather than just saying, because we live in a liberal country, we need to make compromises with one another because we need to preserve a certain amount of individual freedom, um, we start saying good leaders are those who compromise. So compromise goes from being something we do to something that we espouse as being a sort of moral good. And I guess this is this is getting away a little bit from liberalism and illiberalism thing for just a moment, but just to say that this is the this is that wedge is where I sort of stage the critique of the book, where I say, yes, we all make compromises. That's something we do, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's the way that we live with one another. But the problem comes in when we start value, valuing compromise for its own sake, when we start saying that compromising is always better than not compromising, mm -hmm. when we think that people who have sort of a tone of moderation are by necessity more more responsible or better or in the cultural or political yeah. sphere, mm -hmm. or more trustworthy than sure. people who are more extreme or more strident in their views. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, that, that's why liberalism is important to the project and sort of where compromise and liberalism hit each other. Um, in response to that, I'm I'm interested in looking at illiberalism, which uh, is a term that gets used less often. And it when it does get used, it's often used as a pejorative. Mm -hmm. So you know, Donald Trump was referred to as illiberal by a lot of people. Um, the far right is often referred to as illiberal in the sense that often these movements and individuals are explicitly against um, sort of the notions of freedom and individuality that a lot of us hold um, dear. But I was interested in particularly looking at works of art that staged experiments in what illiberalism could look like um, that wasn't authoritarian or neo-fascist, mm -hmm. um, but was instead sort of um, in favor of thinking collectively, in favor of thinking in terms of structures, um, interested in extremity, um, and so a lot of the artworks that I bring into the book uh, are these sort of illiberal interventions that I'm hoping will kind of spark us to think about alternatives to just to see sort of liberal values like compromise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was I was fascinated that you brought in so many, so many different examples. And and I just thought um, and, and I think I think any reader of this book will 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 perhaps have the same reaction that I did. I was really in awe of just I, 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 of what the amount of research I assumed you had to put in it, because the the topics are so expansive and the examples in just art, for instance, are so expansive that um, I think anybody who has a has a background in in writing and or research um, can really appreciate all that's that that you've packed into this. So it's one of the things that I that just on a technical level, I really loved. I mean, that's the advantage of having been an academic first, right? Like I do, I know how to do research and I know how to do research fairly efficiently, I think. Like yeah. that is a skill that researchers develop over time. Um, but this was, you know, this research was always a joy because it was always motivated by real, like genuine curiosity. Like, I think my favorite bit of research for the book um, was the, was getting to go to the Riot Girl archives in New mm -hmm. York. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't actually do a lot of archival work in my scholarship. A lot of people do, but because my work is mostly on contemporary stuff, I don't often yeah. need to go to archives in order to learn about the subjects I'm interested in learning about. Um, so it was sort of interesting to do this kind of conventionally scholarly activity, but toward a project that was really a passion project because I was mm -hmm. looking at this, um, these Riot Girl artifacts that, you know, in part were sort of like artifacts of my own history and childhood and adolescence. Um, and so there was there were a lot of moments in the book where I was able to look into things that gave me real pleasure as well as mm -hmm. allowed me to learn a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. And 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 perhaps make connections that that um, I, I just wonder if they were surprising to you along the way, but they just seemed to, at least the way that you put them in the book, seemed to blend so seamlessly. Lots of surprises along those lines. Lots of surprises and um, a lot of kind of um, startling uh, moments of connection. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, finding it was it was interesting, for instance, looking, I was interested in writing on Barack Obama's presidency just because he was known as this sort of passionate compromiser. And so right. I wanted to write on him. But then um, learning that uh, one of that he invoked compromise initially in this very, very early interview um, as something analogous to a work of art, 
So he, he says a good compromise is like a, a good sentence or a good piece of music. I mean, that just shook me. Like I was, just, I was, you know, as an art critic, I was, I was absolutely astonished to see Obama making, essentially making his initial sort of explorations into political sort of both political um, self-marketing, but also real political thinking in terms yeah. of what he might do as president in aesthetic terms. That was just amazing to find that out. And you have that in the book. Yeah. <laughs> so you wrote this. This is a bit of a follow up. You wrote an article for the for the account called Six Propositions on Compromise Aesthetics. Can you talk about the relationship of the avant garde to your concept of compromise aesthetics? Yeah, sure. So I talked a little bit about compromise aesthetics earlier. Um, mm -hmm. It was basically this idea that contemporary literature has has this is constantly making these compromises between experimentalism and um, sort of mainstream strategies. And, you know, the avant-garde of the early 20th century, and by this I mean, you know, avant-garde associated with the left, like um, Dadaism and Surrealism, or avant-garde associated with the right, like Futurism, um, were explicitly against compromises. Um, they saw, I mean, it, a good example, for instance, of a self-consciously illiberal avant-garde was Futurism, which unfortunately did end up getting sort of resolved into Mussolini style fascism later on. Mm -hmm. um, but they thought that, you know, compromises in art ruined art. Um, and, and that was a tendency among avant garde from all political sides of the spectrum. Um, and it's, you know, I think most people think today that having a sort of rigid concept of the avant garde is naive because of the way that the market has sort of taken over um, most opportunities for publishing. And honestly, like a lot of the critics of the avant-garde of the early 20th century point out the ways in which avant-gardists were always financed by people with money. They were always sort of um, in public culture in ways that they didn't want to admit. So I, I think it's really important not to hold on to some sort of pure notion of avant-gardism as something that's possible for us now or that ever existed. But I think the main change, and this is something I was dealing with in that, that early essay, um, is that at there was a time in which artists could at least self-fashion themselves as against mainstream culture and especially as against capitalism. Um, and to try to fashion oneself in such a way now uh, really does look in the sort of contemporary literary cultural discussion silly. Um, and I think that that is sad and it limits the political possibilities of sure. art. And so that was what, that was kind of my initial spark for that essay, which then of course gave rise to the book. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've had some really, I mean, the book has, has only been out for a, a short amount of time and you've already had some excellent reviews, uh, including what I think is a brilliantly written essay by Chris Lehman in The New Republic. And I want to read a paragraph from the earlier part of Mr. Lehman's piece and get your thoughts on what it means to you when readers really comprehend your ideas and conversely, when you think they completely miss the mark. So to set this up, uh, Lehman begins his article discussing the blatant sabotaging by the Republican party of the democratic process in an effort to gain favor with their base while the majority of the democratic party continues to mire itself in what is clearly a, a futile effort to achieve meaningful compromise. So here's the quote. The irony here is that the talismanic faith in compromise has long since been has long since come unmoored from the principal virtue most commonly invoked to justify it, rationality. The idea of pursuing a grand bargain with a party organized around the principle of blowing up procedural norms at every opportunity is a rank delusion, akin to trying to instruct a feral panther in a ballet. Clearly, there's something more to the liberal cult of compromise than the sane measured grasp of reality it continually professes. And the great virtue of Rachel Greenwald Smith's essay collection on compromise is to probe the broader allure of compromise in political thought, artistic expression, and pop culture. I mean, from, from my end, it seems like you really nailed it. So yeah. I, I'm just curious as to how, what your take on it is when people like him, if you think he nailed it, and, and when others just like don't, don't really get your, your point. You know, I mean, I can't even tell you what a pleasure it is to have someone that smart read my book that well. Like it, like that, you know, if that, if that only happens once in my life, that's enough for me. That makes all of the writing and all of the time worth it. Um, I think that I, I love that review. I really respect Chris Lehman's work. 
Yeah. Um, in a lot of ways, he knows more than I do about liberalism and politics. And so it's a pleasure to see him um, take my ideas and then pull at, in examples that I wouldn't have initially even thought of. Um, I wish that there were more reviewers out there like him, frankly. Um, yeah. As for when people um, misunderstand my work, you know, I think I have spent so much of my life as a teacher that I always sort of see that as an opportunity to talk with somebody. <laughs> Mm -hmm. At least ideally. Sure. I mean, yeah, I don't think point. I think I've been lucky. I think I've been lucky enough that I don't I, I don't think I've ever been the victim of real bad faith. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that would feel different. Um, I have I have had people make really strong critiques of my work. So that that essay that you referenced earlier, six compromise, six propositions on compromise aesthetics, mm -hmm. um, the uh, literary critic and poet Stephanie Burt, who I have enormous respect for but did sort of cite in a critical way in that essay, um, wrote a very strong sort of refute, attempt to refute, refute my argument. Um, mm -hmm. And then I was invited to respond to her response to my argument. Um, and, you know, it was hard to read because I did think at the time that um, Stephanie didn't entirely, uh, it wasn't that she misunderstood me. It's, it was perhaps that the sort of, um, basis of my claim was sort of seemed to fall away in her response to my work. So she was really interested in um, sort of coming back at the parts of my work that were in praise of um, kind of a, a no sellouts pro avant-gardist posture. And she was making the argument that art has always been, has always thrived on compromises and hybridities and mm. all of, and sort of the, its, its own development has always been about a kind of dialectical relationship between um, the counterculture and the culture, subcultures and the mainstream. Yeah. And I think she's absolutely right about that. I do think that, that um, ultimately her response to my work helped me reflect find my own arguments much better. Um, and at least, you know, this is this is the part of me also, I think it's part of me as a teacher, but it's also part of me that came from a culture of scholarship. Like that's that's what we do as scholars, right? Like we publish things, people respond, they say, oh, I think you weren't quite right about this. And then you write something new in which you take in that critique and you get better. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, right, if you're given the opportunity, now, sure. Yeah, but I think a lot of our culture now is really, there's this idea that to be critical of something is to hate on it rather than to try to help it be the best version of a project as it can be. And I really try as hard as I can to think about critique as productive, um, as long as I'm given space to do so. I suppose if someone really like issued an ad hominem attacks at me or something like that, I wouldn't be able to do that. But if it's about ideas, I feel like I can, I can work with that. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. So, let me flip this into something um, more uh, about process. So, when when you're when you're working on something like this book, or or just um, you know, or even just just uh, a, an essay for a publication, how do you go about it when you sit down to write? What's what's your what's your what's your structure during the day? Um, I do better writing in the morning, which I know a lot of people do, um, but I'm not an early riser. So I tend to get um, everybody out of the house <laughs> or myself out of the house. And yeah. then um, my writing hours are usually from, you know, nine to 11 or nine to noon. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm sort of, if I can manage those hours during the semester, I have a harder time sort of blocking them off. Although I do try to avoid making appointments before 11 if I can, because I try to see if I can write in the morning still. Um, and I, I'm pretty good at while I'm writing, insulating myself from distraction. That's something that I know is hard for a lot of people. I, I take such pleasure in having these little moments carved out for myself that mm -hmm. it, it's not tempting to me to check in on email and things like that, because I like, I, I hold it so sacred to have a little time away from those things um and you know it depends on what I'm working on sometimes I'm sort of just sort of drafting and writing what comes to mind and sometimes I know I'm some I'm in a place in an argument where I kind of know what I need to build and so how much I write and what that process exactly looks like depends a lot on what it is exactly that I'm working on 
Do you, are, are there any particular parts, and I, and I ask this with, with each writer that I speak with, um, that you find particularly uh, exhilarating or, or onerous when, just as far as the writing process goes, just kind of, kind of, it, it's kind of a general question. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think probably the thing that is less common that I love doing is cutting. I really like yes. just, I like, I Good like cutting, <laughs> <laughs> which is probably why so I write impressed. short books. <laughs> but um, for every book I write, I have, you know, probably twice as much material that I've cut. Yeah. Um, and I, I get a lot of joy out of that. I think I'm sort of a sculptor or something. I like putting a whole bunch of stuff out there and then, you know, carving it away and getting something really lean and and I feel like that's maybe the reason I get pleasure out of cutting is because it's when I'm cutting often that I can start to see the shape of the thing. Cause mm -hmm. I kind of, it's almost like I'm doing something by erasure. Um, rather oh, than great by analogy. Addition. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to steal that analogy when teaching. I think, and, and I bet you f have the same experience that when talking with students, that tends to be the thing that they resist the most um, is, is the cutting, you know, like once, once the, the, uh, the blood have been put in project. it's done neato and and there's nothing else to be done with it but it's really that that cutting process the revision process specifically that is so critical i think that's absolutely right i think part of what contributes to that tendency is the sort of cultural focus on like uh i wrote a novel because i wrote 100 words a day or something like yeah. that and it's, there's this idea that once you write the words it's like about putting the words down and that that's what's hard about writing is figuring out, is finding the time to put the words down. And of course, that's one of the things that's hard about writing, but that's only one of the things that's hard about writing. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So let's, uh, let's shift a little bit to writing style. Um, you were in a band in the early 2000s called Looker and played bass. So how for you is the process of making music uh, similar to or different from writing essays or scholarly work? That's a great question. Um, I was always plagued as a young person by the fact that I couldn't write songs. Um, I always wanted to write songs. Um, I had a lot of people that were close to me that were incredible songwriters. And I always felt that I couldn't be a musician because I couldn't just sit with nothing and then make a melody out of, out of something that didn't exist before. Um, and when I became, when I started playing bass, which sort of happened by accident, I, I had some close friends who wanted a bass player and I had played musical instruments my whole life. I had played guitar for a while. Um, I never played bass before, but basically these friends were like, you should be our bass player. And it wouldn't be hard for you to learn to play the bass at least well enough to be able to like Well, with, with a good background in guitar, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I was terrible at first, but they were very patient with me. And um, and I was really grateful to have the, I don't think I would have learned to play the bass by myself. So it was nice mm -hmm. to sort of learn in the context of other people. In any case, what I learned from playing bass and particularly about when in working with songwriters, arranging songs in practice um, and working on bass parts and drum parts and those kinds of things was that there was a part of songwriting that I absolutely could do, which was, I mean, in a sense, it maybe is analogous to the fact that I just said I really like cutting. Like I really liked taking something that already did exist. Like if someone gave me a melody, I really liked editing it and playing with it and thinking about what could be done with it. And being a bass player is, well, you know, you know this, you play a rhythm instrument, right? I play drums, um, yep. Yep. So, I mean, what you're doing is you're, you're kind of revising <laughs> when, yeah, sure. when, you're, when you're writing these parts, or at least by addition, if not by yeah. subtraction. Um, and so I found that to be really creatively fulfilling um, to be able to make something out of somebody else's work. And in a certain sense, that's how I write too. You know, I, I like, yes, writing is, is creative in the sense that you're making something new, but because I write about existing cultural materials, you know, I write about literature and music and film and politics. I feel like it's not that different than um, being a bass player in the sense that there's all these things that are already out there in front of me. And then the question is like, what can I make out of them? <laughs> um, and so for me, that's, that's sort of how essays come together, I think. I'm gonna extend that for just a moment because it occurs to me that you're also, as, as we talked earlier, you're interweaving your own stories with, within the subjects that you're talking about. And um, 
it seems to me that your 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 kind of your your approach with base is kind of the same way about adding something that's adding more to something that's already there. You know, new ideas, uh, whether whether they're more melodic, whether they're lyrical, um, uh, because I think you even mentioned that in the book. Um, so it, so there's that that tie as well. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, the, it's all the way that it started to feel to me as I was writing the book is that it was just all material that I could start almost collaging together yeah. to make arguments. Yeah. So this this kind of bleeds into in, this next question kind of bleeds into that answer. So in an interview on LARB Radio Hour, you mentioned that the idea for Uncompromise uh, was originally a scholarly work. Um, so how did you decide to turn it into a collection of essays? Like what what was the the aha moment for that? It was sort of less of an aha moment and it was more a moment of heartbreak. Uh, <laughs> because, <laughs> okay. Uh, because I, uh, you know, I I have, I, I had written a, a scholarly monograph. I had edited two scholarly, scholarly editions. I'd written a lot of articles of scholarship and published in academic venues. And I actually, after about 10 years of doing that, I had finally felt like I understood how to do it. You know, like I, uh, it took me that long to feel like I had some mastery over the form of academic writing to the point where I felt like I could sit down and write an article and like, you know how, I mean, I guess this is true for our, all art forms. There's a point where you can see it all at once yep. and you're not kind of inside of it and trying to figure out how it's working. And I felt like I got there with academic writing. And it was right around the time that that happened that all of a sudden I just felt incapable of doing it anymore in that way um and I have to say I mean it's as much an emotional condition as it was an intellectual one it was just sort of this feeling like I I just can't I'm not finding any joy in this um because I mean I think it probably coincided I, I'm lucky enough to have a tenured job and so the lack of joy that I was finding in it coincided with also any external any like a lack of any external compulsion to do it mm -hmm. anymore but I also didn't want to be someone who never wrote again. You know, I love teaching. It's something I adore. I actually love administration, which I do a lot of. I know that seems um, strange and maybe a little bit hokey, but I My do. My job as well, so I don't think so. Yeah, but. <laughs> no, I, I, I really right. do love it. But I, I, you know, my writing for me is just like a kind of, it's just like living. It's like what I do. So the thought yeah. that I didn't have it anymore was really scary. Um, and so I just, I kind of made a deal with myself. I said, um, okay it's okay if you feel like you can't write this book that you think you're gonna write, but you're gonna be really unhappy if you don't write at all. So how about we try this? This is my little self-talk. Yeah, <laughs> like, okay. how, how about if we try, like you still write, but you write whatever it is that you feel like writing and let's just see what happens. So that's what I did. I just sat yeah. down every morning, like I described, and instead of working, you know, on this academic project that I felt like it was the thing that I was probably working on, I just told myself it was okay to write whatever. And what started coming out were these sort of little tiny anecdotes, little vignettes, small moments of noticing things. And it, like, I slowly realized I could start trying to tie those things together into, I don't think I even articulated them as essays early on. I think I just thought of them as just little thought pieces. Um, and then it wasn't really until the book went under contract with Ray Wolf where I felt confident that I could actually write it as a book of essays because at that point I had a sense of audience and, and sort of venue. Sure. And then I, I sort of thought, oh, well, like this actually is going to be a book of essays so I can actually write it that way for a long time I thought of it as just sort of maybe an experimental academic book or something like that I wasn't actually sure what it was going to turn into let me just say that I hope that that more academic scholarly writing tends veers more toward what you've done with with this book uh for me personally I I just prefer it um, in the acknowledgement section of Uncompromise, you thank three women and identify them as a writing group who gave you feedback on multiple drafts of the project. So can you talk about uh, what the writing and revision process um, looks like for you? And do you leave time between writing and draft before revisiting it? Yeah, um, those are both really good questions. I think the first thing to say is that I 
uh, absolutely rely on other people reading my work. And when you talk about things that, that are hard to, that's, they're sort of hard to drive into students, like new students' brains about writing. Yeah. One of the things that I am always trying to teach um, students, whether I'm teaching writing or whether I'm teaching um, like sort of, you know, a, a class in literary scholarship, mm -hmm. always encouraging students to have people read their work. Anybody, you know, yeah. it doesn't need to be an expert. But um, I think that like that, I'd, I wouldn't be able to write effectively if it wasn't for that. So I'm lucky enough to live, my spouse is a writer um, and an incredible reader and editor. So I, I'm one of these people who's lucky to have essentially like an in-house <laughs> editor. I try to do that for him. He's a poet. He doesn't need me as much as I need him because I'm writing a sort of more communicative genre. Um, but I, I benefit enormously from that. I, I do have this um, incredible writing group. We're kind of on and off. Sometimes we don't meet for you know, six months. Sometimes we're meeting every couple of weeks. Um, yeah. But it's a group of um, other women who are writing off, uh, sort of similarly across both public and academic genres. Um, and they're people I really respect. Um, and then I also, with this project, I send out individual pieces to experts in various fields. So I have a piece in the book that deals heavily with the work of Miles Davis. I'm not a musicologist and I actually don't know that much about jazz. So luckily I know somebody who does and yeah. who's a musicologist and I sent it to him. Um, the Riot Girl chapter, I sent to the brilliant cultural critic, Sarah Marcus, who basically wrote the book on um, Riot Girl and she gave me amazing feedback. So. I mean, part of that is just privilege. So I'm, I'm lucky enough to know some of these people. Um, but I do think right. that sharing work is essential to the writing process. I can't remember the second part of your question. First was about collaboration. You know, well, and, and do you leave time to um, to step away from it for before you re, uh, before you revise it? Oh, uh, yeah. And I think for me, revision is really iterative. So I, I do leave time to step away from it before revising it. I tend to also read my work aloud a lot so that I get mm -hmm. some distance that way. Sure. Um, but also I... I write like many, many drafts and separated by many, many months because when, uh, for, for me to write a book, I, maybe other people are better at sort of thinking organizationally than I am, but I have to sort of write a piece, revise it, step away from it, revise it until I get the piece itself into any position, any sort of state that I can sort of handle it. And then I have to do the same thing with each piece as it gets written. And then I often have to go back to those first pieces when I see what they are all together. So there's all, I mean, I think, you know, the drafting process for me is, I think I started working on this book in 2016 and I delivered the manuscript in 2020 and I was pretty actively revising all of it that mm. entire time. Well, I do want to say for, for particularly for younger writers or, or newer writers that the, um, when you mentioned that you read your work aloud a lot, um, I think that's critically important, um, whether you're doing it along the way or whether it's you finished a draft of something and you're, you're giving it a break. I think personally, I think the first move to make is to read it out loud before you even hand it off to someone. At least that's the advice that I've given to writers. So Absolutely. I love that you mentioned that. Especially for those of us who never learned grammar formally. <laughs> <laughs> This is like my, I feel like my generation was the first generation of children who were experimented on by not actually being taught grammar. Oh, but just I think you're right. Sort of <laughs> I think that's true because I was teaching back then. So I think you're right. And I'm partly guilty of it. Am I partly guilty of it? I think I stressed it, but maybe not as heavily as I eventually would. Oh, man. So in the essay, Welcome to the Jungle and others in On Compromise, you and you just referenced uh, your partner, I, I refer to him as the brilliant poet, Ted Mathis. Uh, you mentioned that he's already a writer, although he's not just a poet, he's, he writes fiction too. Yes? Yeah. 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 Okay. So I've got kind of, this kind of a three, kind of a three-parter. Can, can you talk about what it's like to, um, to, to live with another writer for one? You, you talked a little about it a little bit just now. Um, what kind of compromise does that entail? And, and what does it look like to be writers, professors, and parents all, all at one time? Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, um, what does it look like? Well, so what's funny is that when we, when we first met, we weren't both writers exactly. Like he was the writer and I was the critic, which, mm. uh, you know, it's sure. a subtle difference, but yeah. I think we sort of occupy those positions and I think we still do sometimes. I mean, I, he feeds me a lot of ideas that then I develop critically because they're ideas that, and, the, and sometimes they're ideas that he's dealing with in his art 
but couldn't like take head on in the same way because he doesn't write essays. And then I take them and I'm sort of like, oh, this is an argument that involves researching this and researching that and sort of pulling this together in this way. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think we ventriloquize each other a lot, actually. Um, and I'm grateful to him for being willing to do that. I mean, it takes a strong ego to allow your arguments to be sort of voiced by somebody else and developed by somebody else, you know? Oh, yeah. And I think we do that Absolutely. for each other a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're really collaborative in that sense. Um, what, what does it look like for us to raise a child together? I think, uh, well, you know, being a, an academic is one of the last remaining jobs, especially those of us that are lucky enough to have snuck into tenure line jobs as they're disappearing. Um, it's one of the last jobs that actually does leave you some flexibility to spend time with, the, with your children, which um, I really appreciate. And we are really equal partners in that endeavor. Um, and I'm not sure that we would be if one of us had a more of a conventional nine to five job. So um, that's really exciting. Our child, of course, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say of course, but she's a, she's a reader. Um, and she, uh, I think, uh, I think she has a somewhat of a sense of what we do. She appears in our work. Both of us have work about her. He has poems about her and I have right. stuff about her in my book. And I sometimes wonder, you know, right now she's, she's eight. I wonder what uh, it's going to be like for her when she's a few years older and can read these things. Um, so yeah, to, to be continued, I guess. Right, it will be to, be to be continued. Man, I, I hope that she understands that how unbelievably cool that is to have parent writers. But of course, that's coming from me. So I, you know, uh, I, I think it's amazing. Uh, what, what, an, what an amazing opportunity for her later on. Um, all right, so as an associate professor of, of English right here in St. Louis, at St. Louis University, what advice do you find yourself giving to your students most frequently? That is a big question. It's a huge question. Um, boy, about writing or about reading yeah. or about being- Yeah, well, person? you know, I, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, well, I guess about writing, yeah. although they're, they're obviously interlocked. I mean, I really do. I, I, I think reading, like, the practical things I say over and over again are read your work aloud, yeah. um, take some distance from something before you go to revise it, be willing to cut. I mean, these are things I think most people say to their students practically. I'd say that as I, when I work with students closely on intellectual projects or writing projects, um, one of the things that I emphasize is um, sort of a toggling between finding the thing that you're passionate about and spending some time really looking into um, the existing research and scholarship on that thing. Um, because I'm someone who's really motivated by kind of, as I said, sort of intuition and impulse. Um, and in, in my younger self, that could sometimes take the form of me just saying things, you know, which I think, again, if you don't have that impulse, then your work can sometimes just end up being dead on the page, because you can be a very responsible researcher and reader. If you don't have a sort of spark to your ideas, then it's really mm -hmm. hard to, to do anything with that. Um, but I, I think that my work has gotten both better and more pleasurable for me as I've learned to um, change my, have an initial impulse and then be willing to change my mind if I read something that contradict the thing that I thought or that makes it more complex than I thought. And I've learned to find actually the most pleasure in that. So that toggling between passion and research is something that I sort of try to articulate to students um, and try to model for them as I sort of help them find structures for their work. Um, yeah, and, and I guess it goes without saying, you, you mentioned this at the beginning of that about, about just the, the importance of reading. Um, and I, I guess any writer I've ever spoken with, um, and probably any English teacher will always say that it's, it's probably the most important thing you can do as a writer is to be a, is to be a reader. Mm -hmm. um, Kirkus Reviews says that on compromise should provoke heated discussions. In the essay, Call and Response and Introduction, you mentioned that you've got a complicated relationship with niceness as a social bearing that you've never properly mastered. So. Um, are they right? I mean, do you invade, do you personally engage in these kind of heated discussions? Yeah, I think I do. Um, I, 
embrace heated discussions in a way that I think a lot of people don't. I, I actually have never thought about this before until I had a, a event recently at Elliott Bay Books in Seattle. It was a virtual event at Elliott Bay Books in Seattle. Oh, kind of counts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I was I was talking to Rick, the bookseller who was interviewing me, and um, he was asking if the sort of um, conflict aversion of the Pacific Northwest had played into my interest in conflict in this book. And I had never thought about that before, but I was raised in this very conflict averse culture um, in Portland, Oregon, um, especially when I was growing up there in the 80s and 90s, when it was it was before sort of the, this current wave of kind of um, coastal, especially East coastal migration happened um, to Portland. So, I mean, Oregonians, the, the culture in Oregon among Oregonians really is one of sort of enforced niceness and um, conflict aversion, real fear of conflict. Um, and I think I always felt a little bit gaslighted in that environment. Um, and then I, or gaslit, I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, both work. Maybe both yeah, work. Okay. Um, uh, and then I, I moved to New York and I, I felt like, oh, everyone here is so much nicer, which was absolutely contrary to what everybody was, would say, you know, right. about what about these different cultures. Right. Um, and I think, you know, I thought about it. I, I think being Jewish is part of this. I think that I, I was raised in a more sort of argumentative culture. My mother is someone who's willing to say when she thinks that something is nonsense. Um, and to say it very strongly. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that's the way that you get at ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I, I expect, I, I'm glad if the book does spark difficult conversations, then I feel like I'm doing my job. Great. Your last chapter uh, of the book, Compromise and Lockdown, addresses some of your experiences and challenges during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this was actually the first essay that I read, and uh, I read it in the Virginia Quarterly uh, well before the release of the book. Um, and I don't, I don't know why I was surprised. It's like somehow I forgot that that essay came from the book. So when I got to the essay in the book, it was like, oh, cool. I didn't, I had no clue. I'm sure I knew at some point when, it, when I read it, because I'm sure it said it, but anyway. Um, and I read that essay right after I read Zadie Smith's uh, Intimations, which is just stunningly good, a collection of personal essays on reflecting on the life uh, during the, at the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, so I, I, I just want to say, A, um, that particular essay just blew me away, yours. And I also, I, I'm just going to go back to what I was saying about creative nonfiction, that for me, it's a, it's a primer on what good creative nonfiction requires, honesty, vulnerability, and engaging storyline that emotionally and intellectually connects with the reader. I, I was so moved by it uh, that first time that I read it, that I read it twice. I ended up going back and reading it. And then I copied the link and I put it just in my, the, the notes section of my computer as a reminder to um, add, it, add it to my own uh, uh, teaching syllabus on creative nonfiction on my website. So that, that is how much I liked that essay. So, um, so all that to lead to this question, are there any particular writing habits or lessons from the pandemic that you would take, that, that, you, would, that you would move forward with? You know, things that you made oh. during that time period. Yeah, I wouldn't say writing habits because I just found it very, very hard to find time to write during that time. I yep. think because I had a child that was at home learning remotely, like uh, I just, sure, I'd right. never had, I like had no time and space to write. So I wouldn't say I had writing habits I would take with me. But I think that, um, gosh, I mean, there's a lot of obviously uh, personal and political lessons to be taken, I think, from lockdown. Um, one of the things that I was interested in in that essay was about, the essay is in part about privilege and it's about um, how in sort of our late capitalist environment, privileged people are very rarely deprived of things that they want. Um, and in some ways that's the definition of privilege is being able to get what you want. Um, and early in lockdown, a friend of mine, we were talking about, and this is in the essay, but we were talking about the um, comedian Ellen DeGeneres said that being in lockdown was like being in jail. Yep. Um, and like, you know, Twitter like blew up. And I was gonna say that didn't go over so well. Yeah, no, it yep. did not go over very well. But we were talking about this and my friend said, um, 
you know, what she means when, when privileged people say jail, what they mean is just they're like not getting what you want, like not getting what you want feels like you're in right. jail. Um, and so I, I became really interested in that, that like the, that lockdown maybe for the first time for a lot of people who are, who had grown up in privilege and live in privilege, put them in a position where they weren't getting what they wanted. And I thought that the fact that um, this enormous outpouring of support for civil rights and anti-segregation and anti-racist change mm -hmm. that followed the murder of George Floyd, the fact that that happened immediately after those shelter-in-place orders in spring 2020, but that was really interesting. Yes. Um, I don't think that it's possible to draw a causal relationship necessarily for the between the two, but the but like the fact that white people and especially sort of white centrist liberals who often have this kind of very edgy language about um, anti-racist protest culture. You know, well, it's okay if it's peaceful, but not if it's violent and people are rioting and that I find scary. The fact that there was really pretty univocal support for those protests, even the ones that did involve some amount of property destruction. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that came in part from that experience of like, maybe a certain amount of solidarity <laughs> around, and empathy oh, yes and, right. yeah, the, the, yeah like that the, the, there are there are That's ways in which this system produces these conditions in some people all the time you know not just during covid and for privileged people covid was the departure you know yeah yeah that's a great point um okay it's the lightning round of the of the interview <laughs> so <laughs> Who are uh, who are some authors who inspire you? Oh boy, some authors. That and I and I know that I could ask you that next year or the year after, and that your answer may change. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, in nonfiction, Joan Didion is a huge inspiration. I'm sure that's huge. true for a yeah. lot of people. Obviously. I love how she um, puts herself forward as a sort of she, she's not she's not afraid to represent herself in unflattering ways which I really, I think is really, really important. You know, you talked about honesty earlier. Right. And I think that Didion is someone who's really honest about the, her own limitations and the ways in which she is um, not always in a sort of ideal moral or ethical position in the writing that she does. And I, I yeah. think that that's really important. Nice. She's um, behind me right now. She's she's on my wall. Oh, is she? I can't yeah, so see on, her. On my, on, my, on my lower right, but yeah. Oh, I, I see her. There. there you go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <You know. laughs> um, so she's definitely right. This inspired me as a nonfiction writer. Um, just in general, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of other examples of, uh, I feel like I always have these writers in my head that are kind of like speaking to me in various ways. I, I think when I first was working on um, this book and it was sort of making that kind of strange, turning that strange corner between scholarship and academic writing. I was reading the Argonauts and I know that book had a, a lot of effect on obviously enormous effects on a lot of people, but, mm -hmm. but uh, seeing the way that Maggie Nelson was able to write um, autobiography in a way that was so theoretically sophisticated really was an inspiration. And I think she's she's changed the rules for what nonfiction can look like um, in really important ways. And then the nonfiction writer, Eula Biss, um, who wrote probably his most famous writing on immunity um, is another inspiration in that way where she, I think, um, also manages to sort of weave the autobiographical and uh, heavily researched writing um, in ways that don't seem to cheapen either, which I think is really hard to do. Um, so yeah, I, 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 in, in nonfiction, I tend to gravitate toward work that uh, integrates the personal, but that goes beyond the personal ultimately, that uses the personal as a sort of location for arguments that expand outside of it. Oh, sure. So what about, okay, so I'm switching to music. How about songwriters? Or should I open it up to bands as well? Yeah, maybe to bands as well. I mean, okay, let's see. Um, I grew up listening, my favorite band growing up was the Bangles. Um, so I, and I have always been drawn to female fronted multi sort of uh, songwriter or like, um, you know, bands that have multiple songwriters, multiple vocalists. That's yeah. something that the Bangles had going on. And it was really sad that all the emphasis always went on Susanna Hoffs, but like that's a conversation for another day. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they were a huge inspiration to me yeah. and continued to be an inspiration to me when I was a musician. 
Um, and then, you know, I uh, write a lot about this in the book, but I grew up in the 90s in Portland and there were just, the music scene there was really important to me, both in terms of the quality of the music. There were some amazing bands playing during that time, you know, everyone from a band like Slater Kinney that now everybody knows about to a band like um, the band Hazel that very few people now know about. Um, that were huge influences on me musically, but also just in terms of generosity and reci recipro reciprocity that was going on in that music scene. It, it, to me, it was a way of learning what art could do socially to see how that music scene brought people together and um, kind of asked people to help each other out um, in very material ways. Um, so yeah. I suppose I could go on, but <laughs> oh no, I yeah no, I'm I'm right there with you, and and I was I was even thinking, um, uh, you know, the Bangles and the Go Go's are often so so lumped together. My when my daughters were just starting out in in, in music, they they got this crazy opportunity to open for the Go Go's, uh, and they Amazing. did, and it was the Go Go's last tour that they were on, and they were so great with my kids as far as just giving them, you know, just just kind of rock pointers, you know, just about how to navigate the the music world as as young people, because they all started out when they were in their teens in that band. Um, it was just such such an amazing experience for them. That's so awesome. And I mean, cool. it's so great now that there's a generation of women that can mentor yes. young women in music. Right. That was something that wasn't happening as much when I was growing up. And I, I, I think it's so awesome that there's like you know rock and roll camps for girls that are sprouting up all over the country and you know these kinds of moments for mentorship yeah absolutely um all right and then uh the the proverbial nightstand question what's what's uh, the reading material on your nightstand right now zadie smith's nw <laughs> because Wait. because she's coming hopefully to and we're just to like winter zadie smith is coming it's true <laughs> and you yeah. get to interview her that's amazing I'm really looking forward to it. So I've been revisiting her fiction and um, I the, this time through, I have just been thinking so much about her use of the first person and the third person in different books. Like I think it's so amazing. She's a master of the third person. And then the fact she that really she gets is, to, yeah. to the first person in swing time is really interesting to me. It's like my yeah. number one question. So. Yeah, great. Yeah, she might be, she she might be, well, it's, it's tough. I've got some, she's certainly in my top three favorite fiction writers. Uh, she's, she's, or, or just, I should just say writers, because she's not just fiction. Okay. All right. And then um, I, I have to ask what's on your music playlist. Well, these days I only listen to music when I run. So my playlist is pretty weird. <laughs> because it's like workout jams mostly. Yeah, um, okay. But I have one of the things I'm thinking about doing that is someone at an earlier event encouraged me to do this. And I, I don't even really know. I know the youngs are doing this. Uh, it's like putting together a playlist for Uncompromised, which I'd kind of like to do. Um, Great idea. But I think, you know, I don't know. I guess people put them together on Spotify or some such. I'll have to yes, look into it. Yes, you can. You can do it. Yeah. And then just sort of publicize it. I don't know. There's so much music in the book. So I've been starting to think about what that playlist might look like yeah um, oh, other than just idea. the literal things that i i mentioned probably an album's worth of songs you know you, you do yeah absolutely in book. oh yeah. you could absolutely uh, it's such a great idea if we'll yeah see. okay so if anything great comes out of this interview it is it is me saying please do that it's such a killer idea all right i, all right, I would I'll definitely sign on to that <laughs> okay well it leads me to my last question um you are an avid runner and uh, so let's just let's just set the scene. The God of Jog has granted you uh, like a long run chat with any group, no, no bigger than three people to go on that run with you. They don't have to be runners. It'd be kind of more entertaining if they weren't. But That's but you have to be running. Who would it be? So there's two funny things about this question for me. Um, one is that I run very slowly and I'm really self-conscious about that. So the so thought perfect. of running with other people is always terrifying to me. Right. And the second is that I find meeting like heroes or celebrities actually like incredibly uncomfortable and I try to avoid it. So what you've set for me is like the most anxiety producing. <laughs> Sounds like it has the potential for a good play, I think. Yeah, I think I would just like literally run away. <laughs> but slowly, slowly run away. <laughs> I like the idea of someone like Joan Didion trying to chase you and just like tell you what an amazing opportunity this is that you're blowing. 
that's exactly what would happen that's that's exactly what would happen is that John Didion would be chasing me away so like my first thought is like that, that I would run like with my friend Megan who I really like to go on runs for and is, runs with and is really patient with my running um but I know that's not what you want me to say you yeah but it doesn't have I, I didn't stipulate like... famous it could really be anybody so what an honor for her that she's one of the people <laughs> you selected when you could have anyone literally <laughs> yeah probably Megan probably my dad <laughs> oh man I I'm so excited for my kids to watch this, just to hear that <laughs> line, if nothing else. Okay, thank you so, so much for taking the time out to do this today. It is, it is just a pleasure and, and a joy for me to, to, to talk with you personally about, about your process, about this absolutely exceptional book, just stunning. Um, I will be buying copies of it for friends. In fact, as soon as we stop recording, I'm going to ask you about that. And um, and just thank you. This is great. You're kicking off season two. Thanks so much for having me. It's a lot of fun.